Congratulations, you designed your very own circuit. You simulated it in a program like Multisim or LT Spice and built it even on a breadboard or a printed circuit board. And now you want to take that circuit to the next level by putting it on its own microchip. There's one small problem though. How are you going to do that? Because the programs that I just mentioned, like, like Multisim, they don't allow you to create the files that you can send off to a factory to have your chip produced. Here's a bit of bad news, unfortunately. There are very few options for programs that allow you to do that. One very popular choice in industry is called Cadence, and it's also the piece of software that we use at the Eindhoven University of Technology. Now, Cadence in itself is a large pool of programs that allow you to do a wealth of different tasks. Tasks that can be useful for digital design, like processes, but also tasks for RF design and analog design. That large pool of programs with all kinds of different user interfaces makes Cadence, to be completely honest, not the easiest program to get started with when you're a beginner. And that specifically is what I'm going to try to help you with in this video series. Over the course of the next 10 videos, I'm going to discuss how to set up your own schematics and your own simulations in Cadence so that you can find out how your circuit will behave on, uh, on its own microchip. But before we get started talking about Cadence in particular, let's first have a brief discussion of how circuit simulators work in general. And then in particular, let's zoom in on a program called SPICE. SPICE is a program that stands for Simulation Program with an Integrated Circuit Emphasis. It was originally developed at UC Berkeley and was distributed as an open source program, meaning that it could be adopted in other programs, both in free and proprietary versions, and thus has become one of the major standards in how circuits are being simulated today. Many programs that you might already be familiar with use SPICE as the actual simulator in the background. Think of programs like Multisim, LT SPICE, certain versions of Cooks, but also Cadence runs on a version of SPICE. But what does SPICE really do then? Well, let's say that you've drawn your circuit in a simulation program like this, and you press on the simulate button. The simulation program will then take that circuit that you've designed and transform it into what is called a netlist file. A netlist is a text-based file that describes how your components are connected to each other in the circuit, and it typically also contains one of these lines, which is called the simulation type. In this particular case, we would be running a transient simulation for the circuit that we've just drawn. Once that netlist has been generated, it can be passed on to SPICE in the background, which will then do the actual number crunching required to find out how your circuit works. After SPICE is done, it will output a file with the simulation results, which can then be passed on to the simulation program, like Multisim again, which then typically contains some code to plot those results. Now notice how all of the mathematical grunt work is done by SPICE in the background, whereas user interaction is handled by the simulation program on top. So that would be Cadence or LT SPICE. That process works amazingly well for circuits that just contain components that are mathematically well described. Think of resistors and capacitors, voltage sources and current sources. There's one small problem though. If you want to design your circuit on a microchip, the transistors that a factory produces will be slightly different from the transistors that other factories produce. And there is no way that SPICE in itself can capture all the variability between factories. But luckily, SPICE doesn't have to. These factories typically provide model files which contain the important parameters needed to run simulations of their transistors. So if you want to design a circuit for a particular microchip factory, you need those model files. There's no real way around it. You also need something else. After you're done designing your circuit on a circuit level, you will then have to translate that to a layout, which looks something like this. That is how the components are laid out in two dimensional space on the silicon. But that also requires you to know how those components look for that particular factory. Those layout descriptions are also part of what the factory provides to the engineers designing chips for them. The combination of these model files, the layout files, and some other files combined are what we typically refer to as the process design kit, or PDK. 
Microchip foundries will typically have to invest hundreds of millions to billions of dollars to create new production lines. So they don't want the fruits of their labors, those model files, to be handed to their competitors. For that reason, it is often that as an engineer or as the company the engineer is working for, you have to sign a very hefty non-disclosure agreement when working with the PDK. This is not particularly convenient for our educational purposes in this video series, but also in the education at CUE. So it's for that reason that we've chosen to use a PDK that is freely available, but also completely fictional. It's called Free PDK 45. It was provided by NCSU, and it is a completely fictional technology. No foundry on earth can produce chips for this particular process. It also means that the files can be shared freely without having to sign any non-disclosure agreements. So there are no major legal constraints bound to the circuits that you're going to design with FreePDK45. And as the name implies, it mimics a 45 nanometer technology pretty well. Another side note about FreePDK45 is that it is not nearly as complete of a model as the models provided by real foundries. But for a beginner in integrated circuit design, it should offer some useful insights into how circuit design works at 45 nanometers. Once you know how to work with Cadence and free PDK, you should be more than suited to then switch to a real PDK with very little problems. In this video, we discussed what Cadence is, what a PDK is, and how it relates to the circuit simulator that lies in the backhand of Cadence. In the next video, we're going to look at how to set up your computer so that you can get started working with Cadence. See you then.